Welcome back, everyone. Let's dive right into the deep end. It's a tragic reality. Southern resident orcas have been endangered for 19 years now. Southern resident orcas were listed as an endangered species in 2005 when there were 88 in the population. Now only 74 are remaining. Joining us to continue the conversation this morning is Howard Garrett, the Orca Network co-founder and board president. Howard, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about this. Endangered Species Day was earlier this month, a call to action for species still struggling. Unfortunately, that does include southern resident orcas. So what's changed over the years that's led to a decrease in the population? Well, it's really been a continuation of uh, the shortage of Chinook salmon. Uh, that is their uh, absolute uh, go-to for their diet. Uh, they are a cultural community that has specialized for thousands of years on the abundant Chinook salmon pouring out of every river and into the Pacific and coming back as big adults uh, once were three to five feet long and up to a hundred pounds in some cases and so it was abundant until uh, all of the environmental destruction that has gone on really for the past 150 years but uh, everything from over harvesting to dams to uh, every kind of habitat destruction has diminished the Chinook supplies out there to well under 10% of what they historically were. And that's just not enough for these orcas to be able to successfully reproduce to replenish their population. Yeah, there's also this uh, key threat to whales that isn't talked about much. And we see that's these toxicants. Can you talk more of us about that, how they're endangering whales and how human activity is playing a role? It's kind of a double whammy because the toxicants in question are the persistent organic uh, organochlorines, which are pollutants that uh, attach to every life form, every living cell of plant or animal. So they work their way up the food chain. And of course, orcas, as the top predator of the ocean, are at the top of the food chain, so it all accumulates in their bodies over their long lifespans that are pretty much equivalent to human lifespans. So they have all these toxins and they're lodged in their blubber because they are lipophilic, meaning they attach to fat cells. And so they're in their blubber all around their, their whole bodies, but when they get hungry, then they start to metabolize their fat supplies in order to have energy and that puts all those toxicants into their bloodstream and that's where it does the damage to their hormone system their immune system their reproductive systems and that's where uh, they just can't survive can you expand more on how essential it is for uh, chinook salmon to be recovered to the southern resident orca recovery how do those two go hand in hand yeah it's really critical that salmon uh, runs, you know, the populations of salmon all around the whole Pacific Northwest uh, be replenished. And a lot of that work is being done. I mean, it's really death by a thousand cuts. And so we need a thousand band-aids. And it's, it's been, uh, there's been a lot of effort to do that. But really, it was uh, in the 1990s. Uh, in 1995, uh, the population was looking good. There was almost 100 southern resident orcas. And then started that steep decline of about 20% over five or six years. And that's what led to their listing under the ESA, finally, in 2005. Uh, but it became apparent to some people, at least, and now it is universally, that the Chinook salmon uh, lack, the, the, the just the decimation of the Chinook salmon populations was impacting those orcas and they just weren't getting enough to eat. They were essentially starving. So uh, that's been the picture for uh, over 25 years now and, and we just need to act on it. Uh, each year, June is declared Orca Action Month. What's the Orca Network and the Orca Salmon Alliance focusing on this year? Well, this year the theme is toxicants. It's uh, to bring out that problem because it's the you know half of the double whammy when they are 
hungry, they uh, metabolize those toxicants and that's what does the harm to their immune system and their whole hormone system. So uh, it is a focus on how are we going to address uh, the whole toxicant issue. So it's Orca Action Month now, all of June, and it will we'll focus on how to, uh, how to mitigate, clean up, and remove those toxicants from their environment. What other actions do you think need to be taken to allow this species to recover? Well, I really feel it, it is so critical to restore salmon, and that is a, a huge effort, multifaceted. There are just so many ways that uh, that needs to be done. Uh, everything from, you know, wetlands and shorelines to estuaries and uh, river systems and, of course, dams. Um, it was written into the ESA language uh, in, in 2005 when, uh, when they were listed that the single greatest change in their food supply has been the salmon coming out of the Columbia Basin system and that includes the snake river and of course the snake river has four dams that are blocking the uh the progress of salmon both downstream and upstream primarily downstream actually the the small smolts can't get to the ocean because of those reservoirs so actions like uh those dams really do need to be removed and a whole lot of other efforts all around. The Elwha dams are removed, the Klamath dams are now being removed. Um, there's a lot of major efforts, so it, it, there, there's a lot being done, but more needs to be done on local levels, a lot of cleanups and, and uh, just uh, repairs of habitats. One last really quick question here. When we talk about those toxicants, are we talking about microplastics and just other debris that gets into the water and other pollutants? Well, the main one over the years has been uh, polychlorinated organochlorines, uh, PCBs is what they are. Uh, and they were used as a sort of a uh, fire retardant uh, industrially in uh, all sorts of products. And then they were banned in the 70s. And so uh, people just dumped barrels of them into the ocean, not knowing that each molecule is a persistent pollutant that can harm wildlife. Um, and then since then, there have been PBDEs, which are flame retardants. And and we're worried about, uh, you know, when there are wildfires, uh, the planes drop flame retardants to try to put out the fire, of course. But uh, that also can, you know, get into the rivers, into uh, all the fish, all the wildlife, and into the orcas ultimately. So. Um, there, there's a lot of things to address. There is. All right. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Very important to spread awareness on this, to think that our sovereign resident orcas have been endangered for over 19 years, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's not getting better. It's, it's quite scary. Well, but we, do, we do stories all the time. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I think there was a, a southern resident calf that had died recently, and it all comes down to salmon. And he's talking about these infrastructure changes uh, between you know, what kind of chemicals we use on um, some of our products, and then also the dams, as he was talking about that infrastructure and changes, he wants to see those go away. It's not just what happens to plunk in a water, you know, it's all about kind of our infrastructure and the way that we build our society around it. The way that we live, and you have another story that you've done on uh, with the Seattle Aquarium about oh, microplastics. The, yeah, and, microplastics mm -hmm. and some of the PFAS, um, which are the types of those chemicals that he was talking about now, the forever chemicals. Those really, really, really bad ones were banned back in the 70s, and now we still have some bad ones that are still um, kind of included around mm -hmm. a lot of products that we buy. It can be damaging to our marine life, for sure.